Hello and welcome to another episode of Oh What's a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. I'm Angus Wallace and with me today, as ever, is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshaw, and with us uh, is Samuel Foster. Sam is visiting fellow at the University of East Anglia and author of Yugoslavia in the British Imagination, Peace, War and Peasants Before Tito. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing the changing portrayals uh, and understandings of Franz Ferdinand. Uh, so welcome, Sam. It's nice to have you with us. I very nearly misread your book, nearly misread your book as uh, War Peasants Before Tea, um, which would have been a bit bizarre. There we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Sam, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, how your research and interests intersect intersect with um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It uh, probably starts all the way back in school, actually. Um, being a somewhat bookish recluse, I um, tended to read a lot around the war itself. I obviously had had um, various uh, long deceased uh, relatives who who'd fought in the conflict, predominantly on the Western Front, although I believe one of them was actually at Gallipoli. Reading around it, I actually started to cultivate something more of an interest in um, what's often termed the origins of the First World War, or rather the chain of pro- causality leading towards it, if you like. And much of this, again, was probably cultivated by the fact that in uh, at GCSE, there's a one of the kind of uh, dominant topics you actually learn in GCSE history is the causes of the Second World War, not so much the causes of the First World War, so um, which is all which I, I, I actually thought was slightly interesting. As I was sort of reading, what started to strike me was the fact that um, this very Anglo-centric narrative we have, particularly in Britain, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, when you try and apply that to sort of this context as to why the First World War happens, Britain doesn't really appear appear as a as any real kind of protagonist as is often presented when the actual war starts. And that's probably what really thick hooked me in. It wasn't really Franz Ferdinand himself, or to give him his full name, Franz Ferdinand, Archduke of Austria Est, just to give him his full official sounding title. But it was more kind of uh, the politics and the sort of spheres in which he operated, particularly Austria-Hungary, or what was um, or what's offic- was still officially termed the Habsburg monarchy or the dual monarchy, as well as the Balkans, which again my book very much is very much um, focuses on especially kind of Balkan history in particular. And that, I would say that's probably really kind of what um, what sort of then pushed me on further to do more research into this. When I was at university, as an undergrad, I did a special course on the history of Yugoslavia. Again, was tended to be a bit more front-weighted, um, weighted more towards the um, sort of the period after the First World War, where you have the First Yugoslavia, then the Second World War, then the, then the second Yugoslavia under Josip Broz Tito, um, which, which was, became a socialist federation. And then subsequently, it's collapsed in the 1990s, which um, many of your listeners may probably be more familiar with. And again, but again, that experience also sort of further pushed me to develop more of an interest in the earlier period and the origins of these things, subsequently leading to my uh, studying of my master's and then ultimately writing the book. So I would, that's, uh, to, yeah, in a very roundabout way, I'd say that's where my interest comes from. <laughs> I wonder in, 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 if, if you're looking from the British perspective, we possibly do him a disservice, uh, Franz Ferdinand, insofar as he's very, He's 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 almost the man that caused the war. Um, you, you sent us that black adder quote, which I completely forgotten when a bloke called Archie Duke shot an ostrich because uh, he was hungry. Um, <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> uh, is that you know how, how much is that a rep- is that a, a, a classic British representation of it? How, is that how he was at the time viewed um, in Britain? Are we? Has our narrative moved on? I don't really know. This is probably to give you to make you to probably disappoint all of you. I don't really know. It's very hard to say because, again, it's not something that comes up. I mean, I think Franz Ferdinand himself can almost be viewed as some almost as a skeleton key for just how Westerners in particular understand the war. In that sort of sense, you can almost say, yes, he is the man who causes the war and that he, quote unquote, creates this entire mythology around the war um, and how kind and how it's really understood in the West, despite the fact that very few people in Britain, unless they actually study 
history as an academic subject actually know anything about him. And this is probably a sort of center, uh, sort of um, the root cause of a lot of fascination and frustration I have with, uh, let's just focus on Britain, just to keep things simple, British understandings of the First World War. Again, if you sort of look at, um, I'm sure, I mean, I believe, I believe you've, had, you, you've all in previous episodes pretty much discussed this. I mean, Chris, I believe in, I can't remember if it was, I think it was maybe in your first episode, actually said one of the, pro, uh, one of the issues is a lot of people don't, even Britain don't really even know what the war was about a lot of the time um, in terms of its actual political causes. And let's be honest, the war was about politics, even though we don't like to. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking again of that quote by Alan Bennett. We still don't want to um, know, admit the war is partly our fault because so many of our people died. If you think of that, if you go back to the history boys. The idea of the war as either being one, this big grand operatic tragedy, wherein thousands of men, or, and it, it, again, it's always, always taking place on the Western Front, thousands and hundreds of thousands of men are going over the top and dying, or this kind of um, introspective period of melancholia, but, but, which, is kind of, which comes with these sort of ideas of remembrance. I wouldn't say that's kind of stifled our understanding of the war, but it certainly doesn't necessarily always help it. And because because really in that kind of in that in those when, when you have those two frames of reference, Franz Ferdinand just becomes this very obtuse kind of almost irrelevant, uh, this kind of he, he, just, he essentially becomes almost the war delivery mechanism, if you like. He doesn't really have any agency. He's just there. He gets he's just some kind of aristocrat from some country that nobody understands that's apparently going to collapse any moment. He gets shot by some angry by an angry man. And that's the war and then, and then boom you're into almost you're all, you're not even 1914 to 1915 aren't often aren't even featured into it you're just in night it's just 1916 suddenly and the battle of the Somme's about to start that seems to be kind of the narrative a lot of the time oh, yeah. it occurs to me you know if we're thinking about this as academics first which which we are um the you know Franz Ferdinand is part of the the study of the origins of the war. He's you know he's not there for for August 1914 onwards. He he stops being a player. He's only a player in the run up to the war. So in studying the history of the war, for those of us who focus on the social and cultural history of the war in particular, rather than the diplomatic history, if you will, or even some of the military, you know, even military historians who are looking at uh, development of tactics and learning and all, all the rest of it. The question of Franz Ferdinand isn't really a particularly interesting one, and I, I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't a sense in which the historiography of the war, to be really academic about it, hasn't expanded. I, I do remember when I was an undergraduate, there was an Origins of the First World War seminar that I took. There was also an Origins of the Second World War seminar, which mainly what I took from the Origins of the First World War seminar was that the... Um, the French Secret Service is based at the Quai d'Orsay, and I don't really remember a great deal else. And and given the way in which the memory of the war has, was sold, particularly in the centenary, as being about family history in particular, that for, for most people outside of academic history, the, the questions they're interested in aren't, aren't the diplomatic history questions, aren't the origins of the First World War questions. They are, well, what was the war like once it got going? And Franz Ferdinand doesn't actually have a great deal to do with that. Um, because I don't think a, I don't think a lot of people who fought, and I, I certainly know this is true for the British, but I, but I suspect it's true for most of the other mass armies, had a sense of the you know had, had a sense of the war is about these political negotiations. Um, it might be the war is about saving my family's land, you know, you know, keeping the, the nasty Germans off off my land if you're a French peasant, or you know, stopping Germany invading if you're a resident of Scarborough or something, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that most people who fought thought in terms of the war is about relationships in the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, and Belgium and Serbia and Belgium become become excuses at, in in a similar way. They become sim- symbols as much as anything else. Of course, that's that is very much correct. I mean, for quote unquote the average man or woman in the street, it's uh, that certainly is the case. Um, if we're thinking about Britain. But I think one of the things that tends to obscure is the fact that, um, and again, this is one of the things, the things I've really welcomed, particularly since the centenary. Not sure if any of you are familiar with Robert Gerworth's book, uh, The Vanquished, How the War Failed to End. Well, he's a, he also wrote another book, which, again, you may have heard of, called Empires at War. Well, he didn't write it, he edited it. It was kind of a, a very 
a sort of major attempt to kind of break down this uh, Anglophone perspective on the war as being sort of Britain is the protagonist and will fight Germany from 1914 to 1918, wherein he looks at each of the contexts, wherein he and the, his contributing authors looked at each of the contexts. And what they actually reveal is something very striking. 1914 to 1918, obviously, is where the majority of the wars, the war pattern of the wars, violence and conflict takes place in the West. But if you look at the war as an actual period in history, we're talking about a much, much broader era of conflict running from 1911 all the way up with the Italian invasion of Libya, all the Ottoman Libya, all the way up to 1923 with the end of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of the Republic of Turkey. Obviously, in a cultural sense, that's probably not going to mean very much to people. But I just think there is something of a failure, more in a kind of public history way, that fails to acknowledge the fact that 1914 to 1918 wasn't kind of just this thing that happens out of nowhere and is this great tragedy. Um, and it's kind of the free that kind of kills off this era of un, or undue peace. Because, again, by the 1880s, 1890s, kind of the Victorian era, which we tend to assume goes all the way up to 1914, is basically over. It pretty much is over. Britain is no longer the unassailable global hegemon. Obviously, Germany and as well as the United States and Japan are increasingly challenging it around the world. People in Britain are beginning to notice this, the narratives and the media and the press. And also we we have these debates over splendid isolation. So I really think, again, this kind of whole memorialising of the war, obviously, whilst, you know, it's it's certainly right that people want wish to remember their families, it does tend, in my opinion, and this might be an unpopular opinion, to obscure this sort of kind to kind of almost dehistoricize this entire period. I mean, also the fact that the First World War definitely gets skipped over in the school curricula. <laughs> I wonder to the extent to which, because if we take if we take Britain as a as a as a case study, and you know the centenary did a lot of good things and some bits that probably turned out not quite as we as, as we would have wanted. What I think ended up to to a large extent is that. I, I feel that certainly if we step into kind of British popular memory or popular understanding of the First World War, uh, I suspect we'd probably all agree that the sleepwalkers notion of why the war begins is probably still the dominant one, that that there are a series of alliances, but it's largely an accident that, you know, everyone tumbles down the stairs and then there's a war at the bottom of it. And that aspect plays into a particular understanding of Franz Ferdinand as effectively an unman who is notable only because he, he the only notable moment that we are aware of his life is, is the moment when it ends. Um, it's as if we took if it was a look at JFK and remove everything before Dallas. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've, I've been listening to a podcast about um, sorry Oliver Stone's film JFK, which talks about assassination, and the comment saying set, was saying, does anyone actually know what JFK? Okay, well, but outside of maybe his assassination and maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis, does anyone actually know what JFK stood for? Does anyone know what his campaign pledges were when he ran against Richard Nixon? That kind of thing. So. And what that <laughs> moment of, of reducing Franz Ferdinand to that to the moment when he gets gunned down in Sarajevo is it introduces the element that Blackadder plays on, which is the, the the kind of the tragic farce element of how can a random member of the Austrian no- royal family being shot in another country on the other end of Europe possibly create this ridiculous situation? It, it adds farce and kind of peculiar tragedy to the sleepwalkers element because you know, if you once you strip away all of the the, the, the politics of it, which is what effectively has happened in, I, I think, to, to a large extent in, in the British popular perception of the war, you reduce it down to a series of kind of peculiar arcane alliances that for some reason require people to do things that are, objectively appear to be insane. That why wouldn't a guy being shot in a random city in the other side of Europe cause all of these these issues? And I think that's where Franz Ferdinand lurks in British popular memory as a, a not necessarily a ridiculous figure because we don't know anything about him, but ridiculous because of the outcome of what should be a fairly bizarre but nondescript event. And again, and again, I'm not sort of trying to say that this is the sort of um, that I'm, I'm again, I wasn't trying. I'm not trying to say all British people, like the bulk of British people, are stupid because they don't understand the war because it's very complicated. I just kind of feel that one of the it's kind of um, 
the fact that that sort of never ever seems to get challenged really kind of tends to stunt a lot of our further understanding. Again, when it when it's kind of when you present it like that, yes, it does seem bizarre. But then when you actually add the political context in which all of this takes place, it makes it actually makes quite a lot of sense. When you particularly when you talk about Serb, when you look at Serb, what's going on in Serbia and, and what Franz, Franz Ferdinand was actually doing as a um, as a political actor himself, but kind of. Um, and in the fact, the, the fact of the matter being that he wasn't some random member of the Habsburg royal family, he was actually heir presumptive. So <laughs> he was next in line to the throne of one of the world, Europe's the world's great powers. So <laughs> I wonder if we don't expect rather too much. And, and I'm thinking back, back a little bit to, to, to our episode on 39, 39 Days, where, you know, I think we were all a little surprised watching that, that such a good drama could be made out of the politics. And I think there is a tendency, not just in terms of, Franz Ferdinand in particular, but but a lot of, you know, the, the politics of, of how the world went to war, where the cultural tendency has been to strip it out and to 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 think in terms of the dramatic moment of mobilization and the and the the social experiences rather than the, the politics of it. And to that extent, I I don't think we can really <laughs> blame, you know, the wider the wider public in terms of what they understand and certainly you know i look i look at the post-war period and look at the way in which the the 1920s in particular is characterized as the ro- roaring 20s and the, the public history understanding of that and you're going oh wow but it's a lot more complicated and you just look, need to look at I mean, ireland to understand how much more ongoing violence there is so i'm wondering if there isn't something similar happening that that the culture has only episodically tried to communicate this in something like the 39 days, and even that, I don't know how how, how wide reaching it was. Um, so so there, it, it's not just people not not being willing to engage, but there hasn't been any attempt to engage on that level. I think the last major effort was the. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the program Fall of Eagles. It's 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 quite it's it's now very obscure. It came out in 1974. I don't I don't I don't, I don't know if the idea of docudramas even existed then, but it's basically a costume drama. The acting's very wooden and stilted and overly formal. It's predominantly just sort of met. It's predominantly men standing around in sort of formal, either military or formal wear, exchanging sort of ter- exchanging very passive aggressive, having very passive aggressive conversations with each other. And it's essentially um, details the collapse of the German Empire, the history of the modern history of the German Empire, Austro-Hungary and the Russian Empire. A little bit of the Ottoman Empire, but not really. All the way up to the their eventual their sort of respective the years in which they their respective years in which they collapsed. And Austria-Hungary is kind of the centerpiece for a lot of this. I mean, um, Franz Joseph, Emperor Franz Joseph, Franz Ferdinand's uncle, is very is sort of a very prominent character. Again, I mean, it it, it, it very much paints the picture of how difficult. Um, I suppose this feeds into the thirty into your into your episode um, on thirty on th- on the thirty seven days. It character it, it illustrates how difficult it actually is to narrativize this because there aren't really quote unquote goodies and baddies in a lot of this narrative. I mean, most of the people are rather either unpleasant or incredibly boring. And and I'm, and again, I'm 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 not entirely sure how you actually make that attractive. I would say though. Um, if you go back to the historiography, um, and again, I won't say I'm not saying this is kind of a reason why everything's depoliticized and people don't understand the politics. But um, if you look at the historiography right at its very conception from the British and French perspective, there was a lot of att- there was a lot of effort made to um, divorce Britain and France, particularly from any political issues and tons of special pleading done in the early historiography. This is kind of how the war guilt cause was also cultivated. Again, I haven't any evidence for this, but I wonder if that well, wasn't done deliberately, but if that has had a knock-on effect, this very early historiography of how the First World War was going to be presented and construed to the wider public. It's not certainly not that in the Second World War. There's a lot, there's a very clear political through line throughout the Second World War. So again, I just I'm just that's just me wondering um whether there was some kind of motivation, particularly in the realm of special pleading for by on the on part of the British and French empires. France particularly was very much involved in a lot of these conflicts in Central Europe. You can't necessarily divorce Britain or France from the from the origins of the First World War. You can't you, you can't do it. That's my fit. That's my that's my feeling anyway. I also wonder to the extent to which I mean, this is this is going to go into my, you know, top 10 broad sweeping quotes that may or may not get me emails. But is there an element to this? And I think in a minute, 
if we're going to kind of challenge or kind of talk about the view of Franz Ferdinand, we should actually, you know, let, who is this guy? Let's uh, we dig into some of the details. But is there an element of no one cares about Austria-Hungary in the sense that um, certainly in kind of uh, the popular mindset of the First World War is a war against Germany, in certainly in Britain and, and, and France because of the, the, the nature of the Western Front, Austria-Hungary gets relegated very, very quickly to a, to a side note player of, of, you know, an ally of Germany rather than one of the primary drivers of the origins of, of the conflict. I remember, I can't remember if you were there, Jessica, there was a we, uh, like an AHRC BBC thing, it must have been 2013, 2014 or so, when the BBC uh, chat was talking about trying to market programmes to, to people about the First World War and that people weren't particularly interested in particular bits and pieces and that, you know, the, these popular memories had come out. And uh, my new boss, uh, Katrina Penner, was talking about the fact that Austria-Hungary gets off very lightly as they're the ones throwing ultimatums around. Um, in the lead up to the outbreak of the war. And I wonder whether or not there's an element of Austria-Hungary just doesn't appear to be important at the end of the war or in the popular memory of the war afterwards because Germany swallows up all of the animosity um, as, you know, as the greater power. And the relegation of Austria-Hungary in the mindset means that, you know, this random guy who gets killed in Sarajevo loses any further importance because it was all Germany's fault. So it couldn't have been Austria-Hungary's fault. It couldn't have been about this element because it was Germany's fault. And I wonder whether or not that's, uh, you know, the, the the shadow of Germany in the post-war and the popular mindset overshadows or, or eats up a lot of the oxygen in the room that could be reserved for talking about Austria-Hungary and Archduke Franz Ferdinand. One of the issues as well is that, again, this is kind of... Um... And I think this is kind of what a lot of particularly British and French historians struggle with is the idea of something else was happening in another part of the world where they weren't the protagonists <laughs> as well. <laughs> How dare this subplot enco encroach on our main narrative? And th there is, of course, a very practical problem. And I had this one. I was desperately trying to get someone to work on what happens to the care for the disabled ex-servicemen in the Austro-Hungarian Empire after the or the former Austro-Hungarian Empire after the war. And the practical problem is languages. And the extent to which historians, particularly in Britain, but I suspect the same is true um, in France and elsewhere, um, simply don't speak enough of the extant languages to be able to engage with the, with the, with the sources properly. Um, You've also got the idea that it's the former, as you said, it's the former empire. So it's quite, after the war, there's not an entity directly to point a finger at now because it's, a, it's, a, it's all been, it's sort of, broken up um yeah and you have the you have the added issue but there's a massive disparity between the uh the territories that have previously been the quote-unquote austrian empire in the west and the kingdom of and the uh what is what's what's officially known as the crown lands of saint stephen which was the kingdom of hungary over in the east so um i mean one of the problems is that particularly british academia isn't actually all that good at um acknowledging a lot of these kind of differences um have you heard of a book by an author called John Paul Newman called Yugoslavia in the Shadow of War? And I think he actually very much illustrates um, in Yugoslavia, which some people often like to characterise as a sort of unofficial, unaffiliated continuation of, of sort of many of the principles around Austro-Hungary after in the interwar and Cold War periods, that um, he does actually illustrate kind of the difficulties of attempting to um, provide sort of provision and uh, provision and care for disabled veterans no less the sort of um in serbia where there's kind of you know there's there's something like half a million orphan children alongside all these disabled veterans due to serbia having supposedly lost somewhere between 16 to 27 percent of its entire population in the war so um oh, no i mean it, it, it wasn't this was um this was back at the beginning of of my last research project when yeah because it was European Research Council funded, I was hoping hoping to get someone to do France, hoping to get someone to do uh, Eastern Europe in, in some form. And just, you know, the the postdoctoral scholars, there aren't a lot of them out there with with the sort of language skills to be able to do um, that range. Well, another issue is the languages themselves, a lot of them are, because a lot of them are Slavic languages, they're very unlike a lot of the languages people in this country are used to learning. I wonder if we should look at uh, Franz Ferdinand, perhaps not from the Western point of view. You know, if we shift our focus 
uh, over to towards Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, ha- should we start with how he was viewed at the time of his uh, a- a- assassination and give us a sort of a something to move forward from? Do we from? need to go back to Chris's question and who was he? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So let's just um, give a little kind of crash course on who who the man himself was. Um, so Franz Ferdinand uh, was born in the city of Graz, which is in, sub- in today's southern Austria, in 1863. Um, he was the nephew of the then Emperor Franz Joseph. Um, so he was the son, he was the, he was the son of, his, of Franz Joseph's youngest brother, um, Karl Ludwig. So um, again, even again, just to kind of point out sort of this idea of him being a rat of some rando who got shot, he's not actually, he, he was actually for, already fourth in line to the throne when he was born. His mother dies of TB when he's seven. Um, he has a very, I mean, you can almost see kind of a lot, you can very much see kind of why he's, um, he sort of turns out the way he does. He's, he was sort of described as being sullen and sickly. Um, his parents generally appear to have disliked him or were completely indifferent to him. However, at 12, he has a stroke of luck. He inherits, some, he inherits something called the Est estate, which is where he gets his official title, Archduke of Austria Est. This is from one from a uh, first cousin twice removed, which is essentially the, the Habsburg aristocratic way of version of winning the lottery. Um, he becomes one of the most indiv- in, independently wealthiest aristocrats in the empire at 12. So not that shabby, but not too bad of a childhood in material terms. His main interests themselves are in- include collecting antiques, which he's able to indulge very with all that money he's acquired, um, as well as history. Uh, and he's also and this is and this is where we sort of part of this kind of his pre-war image actually sort of um, emerges from. Um, he's very into hunting. He's actually reported to have, in his own words, uh, in his own records, to have shot 274,889 living creatures in his lifetime. He's first sort of brought to, wide, brought to wider British public attention and sort of wider world public attention in 1893, where there's a where an Australian newspaper circles a, a photograph of him posing with an elephant he shot in Sri Lanka. So, um, but even by the standards of the time. His kind of love of hunting was deemed sort of uh, was sort of by kind of the imperial court in, in Vienna was almost kind of almost looked down upon as being needlessly excessive. From his sort of early years, he's sort of um, he's almost kind of looked down upon by everyone. His father, at least, is very is, is kind of very much besmitten by his younger brother Otto Frank. Within the Habsburg monarchy itself, the Habsburg monarchy, which emerged again, it's not it's not certainly un- unlike many other European countries, it kind of emerges as this amalgamation of various familial aristocratic feudal holdings from the um from the 16th century um it's at war with the ottoman empire for a large chunk of its history which um particularly in what becomes its eastern provinces the hungarian provinces very much stifles and um, effectively uh, pretty much kills off a lot of the industrial efforts at industrialization unlike in the western austrian portions of it um in 1889 the, the emperor's own son uh, Prince Crown Prince Rudolf commits suicide in a joint pact with his mistress at his hunting lodge. So Franz Ferdinand is very rapidly becoming the heir to the throne at this stage. Um, yeah, by more or less 1900, he's yeah he's essentially the heir to the he's essentially the heir to the throne. This is made even worse by the fact that he then he then courts and marries a lady known as uh, Sophie von Schottek, who is a who comes from a, a Czech noble family that isn't related to the Habsburgs. This creates this kind of huge scandal. The Emperor Franz Joseph is kind of continually threatening to disinherit Franz Ferdinand. And if unless he annuls his marriage, Franz Ferdinand refuses. So eventually um, the Emperor concedes, but only on the condition that Franz Ferdinand's children are completely disinherited and the throne is then passed on to his son, Char- to his uh, nephew, sorry, Charles. And this kind of this sort of scandal is kind of deliberately perpetuated, particularly in the Hungarian press. Um, since 1867, Austria-Hungary had become what's called the dual monarchy. So it's joint. So it's a quote unquote a co a partnership between Austria and Hungary, um, of whom the Emperor of Austria then becomes the King of Hungary. So that, that's where you get the term Austria-Hungary from. Um, but Austria Hungary has its own parliament, its own budget. Um, it pretty much has its own polit- internal political system. And following kind of his marriage, which the Hungarian press deliberately keeps trying, it, keep, it keeps it tries to keep this whole scandal going. As a kind of, almost as a sort of dead cat. That's where we kind of Franz Ferdinand actually starts to come into his own, particularly from 1905. As the heir to the throne, he's actually expected to form his own shadow government. This is a sort of reform that's brought in instantly by his uncle, uh, the emperor. And he actually starts to do this really well. He's actually very clever about this. 
He sets up in something called the Bel in somewhere put in something called the Belvedere Palace, which is just down the road from the Imperial Palace in Vienna. He establishes something called the Belvedere Circle, which is kind of a close group of political confidants. Alongside Germans, he brings in various non uh, well non Hungarian uh, mem- uh, non Hungarian politicians and experts. He's actually incredibly savvy in terms of his sort of attitude towards PR. He and his colleagues actually sort of court favor with a chap called Friedrich Funder, who is the editor of a very, very influential newspaper called the Reichspost, something akin to the Times or Le Figaro in France. It's not that widely read, but it's very influential in terms of its impact on the quote unquote public conversation, if you like, within Austria Hungary. Does that mean he's trying to curate his own image? Yeah, this is essentially how he's trying to repair his reputation with the wider public. Because for a long time, the public has been fed all this scandal and sort of soap opera drama around his marriage. And so what image is he trying to portray across the empire? It's a bit difficult to say because there's a lot, there are still a lot of conflicting messages coming out of the Belvedere. Um, but he's trying to appease two groups. He's trying to appease the aristocratic ruling Habsburg establishment, um, specifically around his, em- his uncle, who hates him. He's trying to appease this sort of these aristocratic circles by saying, look, I am a traditionalist. I will maintain kind of the various privileges you enjoy still for some reason. I will kind of maintain a lot of the structures of the old state. I will adhere to the Habsburg tradition. But at the same time, he's also posing a, I wouldn't say radical, but a a moderately sort of a, a kind of middle of the road, fairly liberal agenda in terms of politically reforming the monarchy itself. He wants to institute far more representation for non-Germans and Hungarians. And central to this is what he calls the triadist solution. He wants to create in the southern portion of Austro-Hungary, he wants to create a third entity, which would, which is what he would term a South Slavic entity. The southern portion of the Austro-Hungary is dominated predominantly by Croats, Serbs, Slovenes, and um, Bosnian Muslims, who all who all form part of a single group known as the uh, single linguistic ethnic group I might get in trouble for saying this called the southern Slavs his whole plan is to rectify this imbalance that makes the Hungarian prime minister sort of the third most powerful person in the entire monarchy which Franz Ferdinand himself views as very dangerous and so his proposal is to create what it is to create this uh, what he calls a tripartite monarchy of, of, of the Austrian portion the Hungarian portion and then in the south this south Slavic portion the Hungarians, for who, under whom Croatia, who, who are currently under whom Croatia, the northern part of this, is falls under their kind of um, administrative jurisdiction, are vehemently opposed to this, obviously, or kind of met the Hungarian ruling elite certainly are. But this is actually gaining a lot of traction in the rest of the monarchy. Indeed, when Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in Sarajevo, there's kind of the, a lot of popular sort of narratives will say, well, the emperor and the government. They either sort of jumped with glee at the prospect of being able to go to war, of having an excuse to go to war with Serbia, or they just dismissed it as a kind of irrelevance because Franz Ferdinand's um, nephew was going to be, was the was next in line to the throne anyway, and he's still kicking about. So who cares? You actually kind of read sort of a lot of the press reactions, and even even in Vienna, it's almost depicted in apocalyptic tone. I don't know how accurate this is, but there's sort of dis- there's descriptions of people kind of break it. There's like mass mourning. It's kind of um, presented in this sort of civilizational changing moment. And if that's in Vienna, is it the same in Sarajevo? Is it the same, the same in, in these other... The problem with the, problem with the media in Austria-Hungary is it's so heavily dominated. It's so heavily focused on Vienna and Budapest. So no, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, is it coming out of all the press or is it coming specifically from the paper that he had been using... A, to spin his image. A lot, of it, a lot of it's coming from the liberal press, incidentally. Just it's really interesting to think about, you know, I mean, when we talk about popular culture in relation yeah. to to all of these questions, because I'm, th- I'm thinking of Stephen Badsey's work on, on Hague, you know, a few years later in terms of how th- the importance of the press and different bits of the press in creating reputations. And I think a lot of times we're inclined to think of, oh, this is what the papers were saying with, historically without going back and I know I tell students to do this all the time you know check and see what the position is it the liberal press is it you know uh, a, an editor who's in the pocket of a particular individual who's, who's then spinning you know what, what are these political influences because we do that you know we we train ourselves to do that all the time with the press today we have a some we we assume we know what position different papers will take 
And we just sort of have to, to remind ourselves to do that historically as well in all these different cultures. The one that's kind of leading the charge is something called the Nie Freie Presse. Yeah, this is kind of the leading liberal daily that's saying this. The issue is, uh, the issue is a lot of this is kind of, there's different reactions in different parts of the monarchy depending on the sort of the ethno-political context. So in the Hungarian press, it's treated not so much as a kind of great tragedy, as a direct assault on Hungary, on the, on the sanctity of Hungarian nationhood. Even by 1913, the Hungarian press is calling for open military, the open military conquest of Serbia, even in 1913. So one of the problems we have with Austro-Hungary is you're having to build on about sort of 13, 14, 15 different ethnic national contexts. There is a, there is, there's issues and there's widespread censorship across a lot of Austro-Hungary as well. Um, Austro-Hungary has probably one of the most repressive censorship regime, regimes in Europe outside of Russia at the time, more so than certainly more so than Germany. Again, you have to be you have to take this sort of pinch of salt. But in a lot of Croatian and Bosnian cities, there are mass sort of demonstrations in sympathy of Franz Ferdinand that actually then qu- are quickly reported on as having devolved into pogroms against Serbs. Serbs who are who are predominantly um, what you'd call sort of uh, South Slavic speaking um, Orthodox. The sort of the, the only real kind of distinguishing fact feature between um, the different these different South Slavs is that Serbs adhere to the Orthodox Church. Croats adhere to the Catholic Church, and then you have Bosnian Muslims in between them. So this is kind of the main ethnic compo- eth- ethnic composition of Bosnia Herzegovina. The government itself also then moves in Bosnia, particular to particularly to um, directly attack kind of the lead sort of leading recognized leading members of the Serbian community. Um, and this continues throughout the war. Many sort of wealthier or more well educated Serbs are actually deliberately put, are locked into effectively concentration camps throughout the war as suspected fifth colonists. Um, so a very similar thing to what the US do to the Japanese in the Second World War. You talk about a very simplistic approach the British might take and Eames being sort of a catalyst. It sounds like you're, it's still acting as a catalyst uh, in sort of those Eastern Europe areas for conflict. It's, I was, it's certainly um, a catalyst, but at the same time, the, pro- the issue is that um, Austro-Hungary and Serbia have eff- effectively already, were already effectively in a state of war since 1908. This is kind of a, what a lot of people, what you, particularly in the British narrative, you don't really, un, you don't, you don't really get. And all of this is to do with Bosnia Herzegovina, Serbia, whose politics are dominated by these very, by these kind of irredentist nationalists, is coveted by um, many within the Serb within Serbia's sort of political establishment and nationalist circles as part of a quote unquote Greater Serbia. It's historically associated as part of the old medieval kingdom of Serbia. From the 1870s, following a series of uprisings, it had previously been part of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. In the 1870s, Austro-Hungary had, quote, had taken over the administration of this province of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's still a province at this time. Quite uniquely, unlike um, the rest of the empire, it's, it's jointly run by Austrians and Hungarians. It's not kind of um, sort of set, there isn't this kind of separation, this sort of distinct separation you get in the rest of the Habsburg monarchy. This, they can then showcase this as kind of a model of their... Of, Austro-Hungary is this modernizing force. But at the same time, it can also be characterized, particularly by anti-imperialists, as being effectively a colony of Austro-Hungary, um, because there isn't this kind of distinctive administrative divide that sort of distinguishes the rest of the Habsburg monarchy in that way. And um, in 1908, however, following the Young Turk Revolution in the Ottoman Empire, Austro-Hungary then breaks all its treaty commitments and outwardly annexes Bosnia-Herzegovina outright. If you read historians such as Luigi Albertini, he actually emphasizes this as being really kind of if you want if you're looking for the origin the, the origins and the actual cause of the First World War, you need to look to these kinds of developments that are kind of decades in the making. So yeah. where does that leave us with, with Franz Ferdinand if he's not a catalyst in in that very simplistic way? What is he? What, how how would you characterize his role? First and foremost, I would just try to carry. I would always say try to characterize him as an actual political actor. This is a period where I believe you've had ninety plus people, of many of whom were of higher rank than Franz Ferdinand, assassinated at this time. This period of history is not a particularly stable or kind of joyful, bountiful era. I mean, you just need to look at the history of Ireland at this period and the number of British officials who are being assassinated. You then subsequently need to look at what happens in Ireland at the end of the First World War, where Britain essentially go, falls into a state of civil war, it falls into a state of civil war effectively. And I would say I would characterise Franz Ferdinand as someone 
I wouldn't say he's kind of a visionary, but I was saying he's someone who certainly, um, who probably more so than his uncle, let's say, the emperor, understands what the problem, where many of the problems lie. He's drawing a lot on his own experiences, including, I'd say, his marriage, his, the kind of the whole maelstrom around sort of, sort of um, sensationalist maelstrom around his marriage. Um, he's kind of drawing on that experience and then seeing, well, how in, in, in the interests of maintaining, maintaining what will, what will one day presumably be my, my domain, if you like, my domain as emperor. Franz Ferdinand isn't really a kind of progressive liberal. He is very conservative in a lot of his mentalities, but he's also, um, if you look at his activities, he's also something of a, prag- of a pragmatist. He realizes that many of these sort of authoritarian structures aren't, st- aren't sustainable. Things are moving, the, um, much of which he uh, is being caused by industrialization, um, the growth of the cities, rising literacy rates, and the increasingly sort of internationalized forum in which Austro-Hungary has to exist. And, th- and, and he's trying to think, well, how can I make how can I make the Habsburg monarchy viable in the 20th century? This is um, I, he obviously doesn't have all the answers, but at least but he's, I, I would say I would say if you're going to think about Franz Ferdinand, think about him in that respect as someone who's attempting to square to square us to square an increasingly unpleasant circle. Do we anticipate then seeing any form of, I don't know, pop cultural reconsideration. I mean, even saying that actually rather produces a, a fairly immediate question of, you know, do we expect in wider Western popular culture to see a reimagining of Franz Ferdinand outside of pop rock bands from the last 20 years? And I suspect the answer is probably no, um, because I suspect at the moment, that that vision of him that we spoke about earlier on in in, in the episode of, of him as a as a man without agency, yeah, as, as an ostrich waiting to be shot, um, rather fulfills a, a narrative purpose that that we have decided to, that we kind of quite like. But the, the 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 image of him that you're that you're giving us of of a far more kind of complicated man who you know, has a great deal of agency, who lives in the middle of a of an empire which is labyrinthine in its complexity and ridiculousness. Um, I mean, you know, we, we said earlier on that one of the difficulties for historians dealing with the Austro-Hung- or what used to be the Austro-Hungarian um, monarchy is the, the sheer number of languages. One of the difficulties for the commanders of the Austro-Hungarian armies uh, was the sheer number of languages. <laughs> so that kind of complexity on, on, on top makes it difficult. But it's it's interesting to add some meat onto the bones of what is barely even a two-dimensional vision of Franz Ferdinand that exists in in wider popular culture. Um, He may as well not exist at all or exist for 15 minutes in June um, 1914. Um, But it would be interesting to see if if there was going to be a kind of a pop culture or even a dramatization or, or a more in-depth examination of him in the future to see what type of thing they'd come up with. In Serbia, in Austria, um, and many countries in Central and Eastern Europe, there have been dramatizations of him. Um, along with Gavrilo Princip, his assassin, um, he's actually viewed in many respects more as a kind of fairly sympathetic victim who's sort of I mean, the villain, the villain, the villain often when he's characterized is just the system he has to function under. That's off. That's that's quite noticeable. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of that sort of popular representation. And I'm wondering if, yeah. if, if Franz Ferdinand's problem isn't almost even more difficult than, than just becoming a cipher for the start of the First World War, that that you have in Western Europe, a tradition of seeing Eastern Europe, seeing that that part of Europe in terms of a popular culture uh, cliche, namely Ruritania, this this idea. And I, I think I think Rudolf, if I'm right, you know, that the legend that springs up about around Rudolf and his suicide, joint suicide pact plays into that in, in some ways that, that Franz Ferdinand already has to face even before he dies. Yeah. The, the, this I you know, you have the prisoner of Zenda and then right through the the interwar period um, this idea of these multilingual small 
Eastern European states where everybody has enormous mustaches and very elaborate military uniforms and the politics are too complex for anyone to understand and they all denigrate into violence and it's all about kidnapping the you know your identical twin um to to put a puppet on the throne type type of politics that that plays into western european representations of what's going on with franz ferdinand that even before he's assassinated that's how he, he's understood and that persists after his death a, a prominent trope in a lot of those kind of uh, in that type in that sort of style of Ruritanian fiction you talk about appears to often be railway line um, railways and trains, um, and the Habsburg monarchy, incidentally, um, when it's in Bosnia, when it's trying to modernise Bosnia and Herzegovina, continually boasts about how many kilometres of, tra- of railway track it's been laying, um, which I think often that probably feeds into that image a lot of the time. So just your mention of railways, because one, one of the things I was thinking of is the wonderful, I forget the name of the author, but it's a French author who writes a children's book called Fatty Puffs and Thinifers. And I don't know if you've ever seen this book. It is, I, I will get a, a picture of the copy to put on the the, the website for it because it involves this under these two underground nations of fatty puffs and thinifers who are having this Ruritanian argument o- over um, whether it's better to be fat or thin and they both have these um, extraordinarily described and beautifully drawn railways as that are key to the plots of the stories um, one of which are fat and one of which is thin um, and so it, it absolutely fits in with that and I think that's it's a French book from the 1920s. Um, I will have to get all the details. Um, one of, well, one of the, um, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't, which is actually, I, I've also noticed has started to creep into historiography, particularly in reaction to kind of the, uh, what Maria Todrova terms Balkanism and kind of the uh, Balkanist idea, ways of viewing things as this, uh, viewing Southeastern slash Eastern Europe as this liminal space of um, between the, the West and the Orient, so to speak, is, um, to point out that if, yes, all right, the lot of these areas were often uh, lacked industrialization, that kind of thing, if you're using that, to, but if you go beyond that as a metric for measuring modernization, they're actually considerably ahead of their time in terms of nation statism, the focus on inte- on sort of the, on the um, integral nation state, incidentally, which is now held up as kind of the, um, the primary model around the world for, for statehood. And even then, I mean, even then, if you look at how what people were saying about the, uh, particularly the Balkans, less so maybe less so about Austro-Hungary at the time, um, if you took looking at the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913, um, as well, alongside the Italian invasion of Libya in 1911, these are actually presented in the papers in Britain and France as as being kind of almost futuristic wars. They they have involved you know aerial reconnaissance. Uh, barbed wire far more proficiently. Um, I mean, everyone says, "Oh, the American Civil War pioneered this," but this is the act. This is actually, but the Balkan Wars actually in in places, not everywhere, but in places, look very similar to what happens in the First World War. Barbed wire, uh, artillery, artillery bombardments. Obviously, kind of this Ruritan image does very much still endure in the in the West um, alongside this. But it's always being kind. It's always either being contradicted, and in many respects, kind of a lot of this area is almost sort of being perceived. Pop is, is at the same time is often being popularly perceived as kind of a canary in the coal mine in terms of what's likely to happen. All right, no one suspects a massive war to break out in nineteen, a gigantic war to break out on the scale that it did. But there is, I, I would say, there certainly is a sort of suspe- there is a suspicion that something is about to come is coming. And there is already an awareness. And this is why I would say you need to imagine that the Victorian era ends in the 1880s or 1890s in Britain. There is an awareness that this is unsustainable, particularly at the sort of liberal deterministic vision of the future is, you know, has, has pretty much is pretty is pretty much dead at this point, I would say. And I think that's kind of probably the most pertinent um, way of almost thinking about how why the East is viewed in this, um, just why the East is viewed in the way it is um, at this point or why Eastern Europe is. So we're actually talking about Franz Ferdinand as a symbol for modernism rather than... I would, I would say, yeah, if you want to think about him in a symbolic sense, you could almost say that, yeah. Again, you can, you can attribute multiple things to him. I mean, a symbol for modernism, a symbol for continuation. I mean, in 1913, barely a year, less than a year before his, his own assassination, the King of Greece is assassinated in Thessaloniki. So out in the open, in, under very similar circumstances, it, it suspected he may, that may, he may have been bumped off by uh, the Greek military high nationalists and the Greek military high command. But again, very sort of similar sort of circumstances. And that's 
And a lot of that itself, that kind of nationalist plotting is something that's often attributed to modernity. Um, this idea of kind of um, modernism, the growth of the nation, the growth of these big, very increasingly complicated modern armies in Britain as well as in Britain, Britain and France, as well as in Germany. And this is why I would say there just seems to be, and in my book particularly, I say how much anxiety there actually seems to be, ambient anxiety there is, cultural anxiety there is. This sense that there is just a lack of account, of, there is a growing, despite, you know, democ there's democracy, but, but that's democracy that's tempered by a lack of accountability by the pillars of, by the institutions of state, if you like. Well, yes. Well, I'm slightly, slightly conscious of time. It's a dangerous gig being one of the crowned heads of Europe. <laughs> Well, it was it was dangerous being a crown head of Europe in most time periods, really. <laughs> Very good. So, Chris, let's. Uh, what will we talk about next time out? We have a plan, Angus. We have an actual living, breathing plan that we are going to release um, onto the airwaves. So, next time um, we will be talking to the marvelous uh, Amory Einhouse about uh, short fiction writing um, and the First World War as part of what I believe, and I'm looking at Jessica's window in Zoom at the moment um, will be part of a run, a little a little um, uh, collection of fiction and the war episodes to probably take us up to the end of the year. I'm, I mean, what's it's it's yeah, it's September. Yeah. Yeah, probably so. Um, not to not to horribly date the, the episode. Worst comes to worst. I'll, I'll just make you all read some Ruritanian detective novels which is what i'm reading at the moment to be honest if it's a choice between that and delton abbey then i will go and get those books and read them with great enthusiasm well, i quite like the idea of what is it fatty puffs and what was it fatty Finifers. Puffs? yeah <laughs> actually actually that that might not be a bad one i i can't remember if there's a direct link to the world i'll have to do some research <laughs> children's fiction would be a great one all right guys lovely to chat i'll speak to you all soon bye bye everybody bye.